know my age, or at least you can approximate it. Uh, Jack, of course, turns 19 on Saturday, and we included that in the bulletin, but he didn't include my age. So when Paige and I were on our anniversary cruise um, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, on June 12th, we had dinner uh, at a really nice restaurant on the boat, and uh, the people came out and sang us happy, happy anniversary, and they said, how long have you been married? And I, we said, 30 years, and they were like, no way. And, and obviously, it's not because I look young, it's because she looks young. And so if, uh, if you want to guess her age and then... I'm three years older. We'll, we'll just go from there. Does that, does that sound good? Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's read together God's holy word. We'll read um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1. And for context, we'll just read through verse 12. So let's read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, 1 through 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul uh, penned these words to our brothers and sisters uh, who are departed, who lived in Thessalonia. In Thessalonica, I should say, and uh, now he pins them to us too. Uh, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much affliction. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, and we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. When we started going through First Thessalonians, I, I guess maybe when I, when I decided I would preach through First and Second Thessalonians several couple months ago now, you know, I was thinking to myself again, as I, as I shared with you, that <clears throat> I think, as the scriptures say, uh, that at the end times, things are going to go from bad to worse. And, and I would say that we see that in our country right now, and not just our country, but the world. And so I was kind of inspired to go to First Thessalonians because it spends a lot of time talking about the, the end days and, and whether, uh, whether the end of days are upon us here soon or whether Jesus returns in another 10,000 years. Uh, it, it's really wise for us to come to the scriptures and learn and understand so that, so that we're keeping our eyes on the prize. We're, we're keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus as he would have us do and not taken or not surprised by the stuff that we see, not upset in the sense of sinful anger or fear because Jesus has told us this is what the end times are going to be like. It's going to be a time of the suppression of knowledge of God and, and when, uh, when we do that as a society, God says have it your way and, and lets us, lets us uh, uh, reap the consequences of our own flesh, as it were, as a society, as I'm saying. Uh, but one of the things that wasn't on my mind was the standard of ministry that Paul articulates here in these words, and, I, and I, I knew it was there. I've read it dozens of times, right? Uh, but yet, as I've been studying this and seeing the standard or the model of godly ministry uh, that Paul articulates here, it's been uh, very uh, good for me, challenging, um, soul-searching, as it were. Uh, and, and so I would encourage you to pray for me, to pray for Josh, uh, pray for the rest of the leaders in the church, that, that as we come to passages like this, that that. Uh, we would take them very seriously because the call of ministry is exceedingly high. Um, the standard there is, is ginormous. And uh, frankly, it's pretty intimidating. It really is. Um, I, I, I do believe that Josh and I and Hal, and none of us are disqualified in any way, shape, or form. But man, do we need to grow? Of course do we need to grow. But that's all of us, right? All of us need to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And and so as we go through this text here today, and, and as we did last week, we looked at the first part of chapter 2. We'll look at verses 7 through 12 today, <clears throat> talking about Paul articulating to the Thessalonians, this is what godly ministry looks like. This is what you need to be seeing 
when you um, see ministers. Because again, why? As John writes in 1 John chapter 4, many false prophets have gone out into the world. And we need to be wary of those. We need to be able to test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. To test those who would come to us with the word of God and make sure that, there's, that they're people that are, are bringing the word to bear. Uh, those types of things. And so, so again, um, I, I do ask, beg, please pray for me, Josh, others of us. Pray for pastors around the world that are bringing the Bible to bear in a, in a way that is submissive to God's word, uh, that wants to bring it to you in a, in a manner that directs attention not to the man preaching, but to the God who has brought the word to bear and always him. Because, you know, as, the, as, as Paul says to the Corinthians, who is Paul, who is Apollos? We are simply... Uh, servants through whom the Lord works. Therefore, the one who brings the word is really nothing. Rather, it's the God who brings the word. And so that's something that we just need to keep in mind. And, and again, as I go through this um, with you today, um, please know that, that I've taken lots of swallows, humbling swallows as I've studied over the past couple of weeks and will continue to do so. When you think about <clears throat> pictures uh, in Scripture, that we find of the Lord. So, you know, uh, maybe allegories or metaphors that, that the writers of the Bible use to describe our Lord and Savior. I, there's dozens of them, literally. Uh, there's a steward or household man or someone, someone who's given charge by someone else to take care of stuff. A bond slave, a servant. This is, this is, these are the words that are used of our Savior, a herald or a proclaimer of the message, a teacher, a soldier, athlete, farmer, common image of a shepherd, a lion, a rock. These are all words that are described either as our Lord or those who would bring his word to bear. One of the most shocking ones is despot. Have you ever seen in the Bible that Jesus is referred to as a despot? So come tonight, because in Jude chapter 5, James will be teaching on Jesus as our only Lord and Master. And that word master in the original Greek is despotes, which we get our word despot from. And that's, that's kind of a shocking one. And of course, uh, James will do a great job. Uh, but when you think about how would you describe yourself, I always get kind of, you know, I hear these things. If, if you could be an animal, what would, would you be? tree, flower, something like that. You know, I always wonder, you know, people will name their kids after flowers, rose or daisy, something like that. How, why not rhododendron or skunkweed or something like that? You know, pansy, these types of things. Yeah, I think about that. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, is that words are never enough. Just one word is never enough to describe us, is it? I could never categorize you only using one word. I'd need several. And, and we find in Scripture that, that God is referred to using several different metaphors or several different words to describe. And, and then by extension, he, he uses, this, the Scripture writers use these same words to describe those who would bring the word to bear. And most shocking, I think, or not, not shocking per se, but, but just really, I, I guess I, I continue to be shocked about this. That when we are to approach our God and Father, what is the first image that we're to have in our mind? Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You, you know the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 7. Or is it 6? I'm sorry. You, you know that prayer. And, and, and that prayer articulates many, many amazing, awesome characteristics of our, of our God. But when we are called by Jesus to come to God, the, the first image he wants us to have is that of a loving, kind, nourishing, compassionate parent. That's what he wants us to have. A loving parent is the picture that God puts of us of himself, not at the expense of anything else, not to the exclusion of any of his other amazing characteristics, justice, righteousness, omnipotence, all, all of these things. But, but we cannot exclude any attribute of God when we're thinking about him. Yes, we may dwell on one or two of them at a given time so that we can learn and understand our great God better. 
but, but one thing that, that continues to challenge me is that, that I need to see him. I need to see him as a loving, sweet, caring father, mother figure. And shockingly enough, that's exactly the picture that Paul puts forth here today of a godly minister. A, a loving, compassionate mother. A loving, compassionate father. And, and frankly, again, that's, that's kind of intimidating a little bit. It really is. And again, as God is, right, as God is, he calls us to emulate his character. Now, now we understand that there's some aspects of God's character that we'll never be able to manifest. We can't manifest his omniscience. We'll never know everything. We can't manifest his omnipresence. I mean, we're, we're stuck here at this place at this time. We'll always be in a location, even in glory. We won't be omnipresent. We won't be everywhere. And truly, we understand we're not omnipotent. We don't have all power. And so we can't, we can't convey those things. We can talk about them, but we can't show them in, in our own life. But boy, we can sure show forth love. We can sure show forth compassion, gentleness, kindness. We can show forth a, a sense of godly justice even a sense of godly indignation about sin that we see in the world. We can surely empty ourselves, as Jesus did, for others. And that's what Paul is calling us to do here. As is God, we are to, and let me say this, we are to manifest his communicable attributes to those around us, but we will manifest these things. Because why? If you're in Christ, what? You have his nature. You have the Holy Spirit within you. And what are, the, what are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And, and again, I look at myself, and you need to look at yourself and say, okay, these things are mine. I have these because Christ in his goodness has given them to me. Now, how am I doing in living them out? Are these things showing up in how I relate to God, how I relate to my family, how I relate to others? How do these things show up? And for the pastor, for the godly minister, these things need to be showing up consistently. That fruit of the Spirit needs to be there consistently, needs to be seen. Again, it's not a, it's not a statement of perfection that you have to be perfect at all of these things, but the, but the direction, the pattern of life must be matching what God says it ought to be. And again, not just for pastors, not just for elders, but for all of us. All of these things, for those of us all who are in Christ, these things ought to be manifesting. And when you look at your life and you read through some of these standards that you see, you read through the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and you say, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lacking here. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit reveals that to you, right? So that, so that I can say, or that God and I together can say, okay, Lord, all of my sins are forgiven. You've taken care of all of them on the cross. There's no condemnation. So now I will, in the strength and grace of Christ, work on this issue of, say, self-control or gentleness or whatever it is that I might need to be growing in. And again, he who began a good work and you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. Well, as we look at this text here today, uh, the same big idea that we had last week, because it's the same stuff, you know, since God's glory and purposes are tied to it, we must see godly ministry and pursue it for our church. So let's look today at the essence of the godly pastor's heart. The essence of the godly pastor's heart. And first of all, there's this mother's sacrificial compassion. These two pictures that Paul puts forth here, that of a parent, a mother and a father, as he relates to the Thessalonians. And thus again, setting before them the, the picture or the idea of what godly ministry or what a godly pastorate looks like. And so, so he says this in verse 7. But we were gentle among you. Gentle among you. Now, what does it mean to be gentle? So it means to be kind to someone and encompass a host of other virtues. It's not just one thing. It's, it's acceptance. It's respect. It's compassion. Tolerance of imperfections. Patience. Tenderheartedness. Loyalty. 
These things all manifest themselves in gentleness. Again, like I can't describe you in one word. You can't describe me in one word. Well, it's hard to describe things like gentleness in one word as well. Uh, again, we, we kind of see it and, and we tend to, know, tend to know sometimes by the opposite. We see people that are harsh and mean-spirited. And, and we understand then by extension, well, that's not gentleness, so this is. This is. And so Paul goes in uh, to the Thessalonians or any other place of ministry, he and his companions, and their goal is what? It's to be accepting of their weaknesses. It's to respect them, not to look down on them. All of us are created in the image of God, right? And therefore, we have a responsibility, no matter how somebody is or what they're like, and even in this world that's really becoming degraded. This people that, that are not pursuing Christ and not seeking to follow him and are living in rebellion to him, they are still, what? Made in the image of God. Still worthy of our acceptance, our respect, and even our compassion. How many of you, before you were saved, were, were living a life of degradation? I was. And then God in his compassion and mercy pulls me out of that. And that's, that's how Paul goes in. And, and he says, we're going to be gentle. We're going to accept your brokenness. And we're going to show you wholeness in Christ. This is like our Savior Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, maybe some of the most familiar passages in Scripture. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Again, I've shared my testimony to you when my friend Scott first invited me to church. He didn't share the gospel with me. He didn't tell me I needed to repent. He didn't tell me how awesome God is or how awesome Jesus is. He said it's a place of rest. It's a place of rest. And as I've shared with you before, I, I was very skeptical of church. I was very skeptical of Christianity, very skeptical of any type of um, organized religion whatsoever. But when the Holy Spirit put it on Scott's heart to say, Eric, it's a place of rest, that just melted me. It melted me. And I found, and I am still finding that Jesus is rest. He is gentle. He is sweet. He is kind. Pastors need to be the same way. It's one of the, it's one of the standards or one of the qualifications of ministry that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The, the, the pastor, the overseer, is to be gentle. He's to be not violent. See, there's the opposite. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. Now, interestingly, in our world today, this is the opposite that we see out there, isn't it? Leaders and those who would be in charge of stuff are, are, are tend, tend to be known as domineering or, or you know, the agenda. I'm going to do this and, and you, can, you can come along with me or you can get out of the way. And unfortunately, we've seen many pastors in recent years have that sort of domineering way about them to, about themselves. I, I've been listening to a podcast in recent months where the pastor, before he was removed from ministry, said, there's a pile of bodies behind our bus. And by the grace of God, there'll be more. Guy's out of ministry. Well, he's not. I wish he was. But, but, but he started a new church, of course, is what often happens. But, but, but the thing that's hard about that is that that is not to be how we are. We are to be kind. We are not to be domineering. Pastors, ministers don't exist for their own glory. You don't exist for the pastor's glory. Pastors exist to come along and serve and be gentle and sweet. I've known of pastors, I mean, you hear about these mega churches, and again, I'm, please hear me. We have an incredibly small church, amen. That's just fine, okay. Do I, do I want it bigger? That's, between, that's the Lord's thing. Okay, my flesh, of course, does, but, but what do I do about that? So, so in saying this, I'm not, I'm not opposed to mega churches. I'm not opposed to churches that have thousands of people. In fact, our home church down in Texas has about 2,000 people in it. Now, that's not a mega church. In the, it's interesting, right down the road, there's a church with 25,000 in that same neighborhood. But, but, but the issue is I'm not opposed to, to mega churches. But, but sometimes I hear about churches that want the celebrity pastor. They want the big name, the author, things like that. And again... I have a couple of book ideas in my own mind. Not that I'll ever get them published, but they're there. And so it's not opposed to writing, but some pastors will say, I'm coming to this church, I will preach, and that's it. I'm not going to do funerals, not going to do counseling, 
not going to do marriages or marriage counseling, none of that type of stuff because I'm going to write my books. I'm going to preach my books. I'm going to preach and then I'll write my books. That's not pastoring. It's not shepherding. That's self-aggrandizement. And that's not a pastor. It's not a pastor. Pastors need to be people who are gentle. They want to be with people. They want to be around them. Like a mother. That sacrificial compassion. Then there's this limitless love. Secondly, a limitless love. So, So Paul says, we were gentle among you. But then he says, like a nursing mother caring for her own children. Again, one of the most beautiful things, I think, as I recall, well, without being personal, you know, a child being held by a mother, an infant, and not just a mother, but a father, that, 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 that baby, maybe several of you, if you're on Facebook, you saw the picture of Rose with that little Alethea, born just a couple last Sunday at this time, right? And that picture of Rose holding her right here. You all know what I'm talking about. That, that beauty, that, that, that tenderness, that sweetness that you see there. There's this desire, it's this affectionate desire. And, and again, you don't have to conjure it up, you don't have to make it, it's just there. It's there. And that's how mothers are. It, 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 the, the word here translated desirously affectionate. You know, like this nursing mother caring for one of her own children. This desirous affection or fond affection. It's to long for someone passionately, earnestly. And again, linked to a mother's love. It's intended to express an affection so deep, so compelling as to be unsurpassed. Unsurpassed. You know, oftentimes you, you think about... These pictures, you can see them positively like this, but think about them negatively in the sense of, of a mother who has lost her child. And the, and the, and the, the, wretch, the wretched pain that's associated with that. Why? Because of this affection that is not, doesn't have a place to go anymore. And it, it's like your, your heart is ripped out. And, and again, that's, that's the affection that, that Paul is coming to the Thessalonians, I, I, I ache for you. My, my desire for you is nourishment and, and sustenance. You know, one of the most horrible things, I don't even read the articles. If, and we, I don't watch TV news. I, I read some stuff. But, you know, almost every day or at least a couple times a week, you hear about a parent leaving a kid in the car and just how terrible that is and how heart-wrenching that is. Well, one time when I was watching TV several years ago, there was a mom that did that, and she caught it automatically. But she couldn't get back into her car, and so she calls the police. And the fire truck comes, and she's got this beautiful car, and he's axing that thing up to get to that kid, and she is, that's all she wants. That's all she wants. Get my child out of there. Save my child. Take care of my baby. That, that, that's, that's the, the, again, it's, it's hard to comprehend this, but that's the, that's the attitude that a pastor or a minister is supposed to have, that, that deep passion, affection, desire. Look, look, look what Paul says down in chapter 3, verse 1. He wants to see the Thessalonians. He says, we can bear it no longer. We want to know what's going on with you. We're, we're in Athens, he says, but we're willing to be left there and send Timothy so we can, we can find out what's going on with you. Verse 5, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. You, you can see a, a pastor who truly loves his people will have this this desirous affection to protect, to nourish, to take care of. And, and when they're separated, there's an ache. There's a heart, there's some sadness there. Well, that's what a true pastor shepherd looks like. Someone who longs and loves his people, desires to see them walking faithfully and growing in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Thirdly, with this, this mother's sacrificial compassion, there's this unending selfless effort. Now, 
I struggled with this one, putting this together, and you'll, you'll note in the second part when, when we get to it that the first characteristic of the father, the father's determined compassion is that of unending selfless effort as well. Uh, these things are not, and, and, and here's the thing, when, when we draw these pictures or Paul draws these pictures for us, we need to understand these are not just exclusively to a mother, exclusively to a father. This is what, this is what godly love and, and compassion looks like. This is what it looks like. And so we have this picture again of a mother's unending selfless effort. Verses 8 and 9. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready what to share with you, not only the gospel of God, but our, also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. You remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, again, so you can use both spots in your outline if you want to, to put this in below, you know, right, right at the end of the mother section and right at the top of the father section. Uh, have you ever had anyone share the gospel with you without love? <laughs> you, you know, they've just come up and, 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 and they're just trying to check off the box, as it were. Maybe you've done that. Eee, I need to share the gospel. And I'm going to do it. You know, this is what God wants me to do what I need to do. That's not good. I mean, why did Jesus come? God so loved the world. And so when you or I go out there to share the gospel, look, I understand there's a duty to do that. Go therefore and share the gospel with all nations, teaching them. There's a duty there, but that duty, like Christ, is founded and driven in love. It's driven in love. Jesus, again, commands us. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is a command. It's not, it's not negotiable for the believer. We're to do this. We're to do this. But what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. So, so Paul says here, look, we want to come and we want to share the gospel with you. We're going to do that because we are affectionately desirous of you. We're going to share the gospel with you because that's the greatest news there is. But as we share the gospel, as we teach you God's truth, it will be bound up and its foundation will be built in a deep, deep love that will manifest itself in the giving of myself fully and completely. Again, think about the mother literally, literally gives up her body in nourishing and taking care of a child. I've only seen pregnancy from a distance. Pretty close, but, but, but distance, right? It's not, nothing I'm never going to experience, but... but but the morning sickness, the tiredness, the pain. I remember the last few weeks of Caleb's pregnancy. Hey, bro, mind if I throw you under the bus? Go right ahead. Okay. Caleb was breech, right? His head was wedged up in Paige's rib cage. And she was in excruciating pain for the last few weeks of her pregnancy. She was literally giving of her own self, giving of her own self. And again, to the point of pain and, 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 and exhaustion, <laughs> using up your own body's resources. I always encourage moms, I shouldn't eat so much. No, eat it all, girl, because you're eating for two. Eat it all because you need it. You need it. You really do. And so you see this picture, and that's the picture that he's putting forth. We're going to give of all of ourselves. We're willing to be expended for you in that regard. There's this there's material and physical expense that, that a pastor will give. You think about this. Think about a mother or a father for that matter, which we'll get into in just a minute. You know, okay, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna give to my children what I get in return. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold a balance here. Maybe you've seen this in recent, recent years, the bumper stickers on the back of the car window and it shows the mom and the dad and sometimes one or two or ten kids, you know how it is, and they're all, they're all lined up there. 
recently, much to what I think is a very, very damning statement about our society, I see a man and a woman with piles of money next to them. And the implication is clear. I'm not going to have kids so I can have cash. That's what, that's what it's being said there. And, and again, I, I understand that God calls some people not to have children. That's, that's God's deal. Amen. And it might be that that frees up resources so you can serve the Lord better. Amen. Okay. But how many of you that are parents would ever, ever give up and demand back one cent of the investment of money, time, and energy that you've given for your kids? I think in recent years I've heard that, that the average cost to raise a child from birth through college is $250,000. It's probably more than that now. I don't know. Goodness. Wow. Look at all the nice house and cars I could have. Does that ever cross your mind? Well, if it does, you need to repent. Okay. <laughs> but think about that. I, I've heard things like that, and I'd say, <laughs> spend it and spend it again. Spend it and spend it again. And friends, that's what Paul is articulating here. It doesn't matter what the expense is. It doesn't matter the sacrifice. The love is so rewarding. The, 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 the willingness and the desire to see people walking closely with Jesus is far greater than any sacrifice of time, energy, resources. Give. And keep on giving. Keep on giving. Because you love. Because you love. Well, again, we can talk about that on the, on, the, on the mother end of things, but we can also think about a father's determined compassion. So we have, in one sense, we have this mother's sacrificial compassion, and we have the father's determined compassion. Now, again, I, I don't want to say that it's, men never sacrifice, because they do, okay? Women are never determined because they have to be, right? It's, moms have to be that way. It's just how it is. But just for the sake of, sake of argument here, Paul, I think, is, is contrasting, not contrasting, but complimenting, giving complimentary pictures of fatherhood and womanhood here, or fatherhood and motherhood, on, on how to put forth what a, what a pastor looks like. And so along with the mother giving unending selfless effort, the father does the same. He does the same. Verse 9, for you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel to you. Now, again, what, what is this picture? It's just this like with, with the mother willing to give physically, completely of herself to the benefit of her child. The pastor is to give completely of himself to the benefit of the church. He, physically, of his own body, her own body, she gives. Well, in this, in this case, what? We give of our effort and energy, our time, our resources, now, automatically, a thought will come to mind. Is Paul demanding that pastors shouldn't be monetarily supported? Is that what he's saying here? No, he's not saying that. We, we know in other places that the scriptures say that pastors should be supported. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says... You shall not muzzle an ox. I love that picture of a pastor. You shall not muzzle an ox when he treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. As a football player, I can consider myself as a way I eat like an ox, right? I'm actually losing some weight, by the way. You pray for me. Let's move it. But when you, when you look at Paul in other places, he was supported in Ephesus and only taught. That's what he did over two years. Didn't have to work. Didn't have to do that because people were supporting him. Jesus and the disciples were supported monetarily and materially throughout their Jesus' whole three-year ministry. So it's not, it's not an issue of, no, pastors shouldn't get, get, shouldn't get paid. They shouldn't be supported. So, so if that's not what he's saying, then what is he saying? It's an attitude. It's a, it's a determination, a willingness to sacrifice comfort and need. And specifically, he would not allow anything to get in the way of the gospel. 
to hinder the proclamation of God's truth here. Now, we sit there and think, well, why is he saying this? If he's saying this, that it's going to hinder the gospel, if he, if he doesn't support himself, why is that the case? I would hope and pray that as you support me or Josh or, or wherever you've been, that, that, that you're not saying, well, by paying Pastor Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm hindering the gospel. I hope not. I hope you're not feeling that way. You know, so what about Thessalonica? Would he would be hindering the gospel if Paul received payment from them? Well, number one, it appears they were dirt poor. They were dirt poor. Okay, again, does that mean the whole city was dirt poor? Or is it just the believers? Well, again, we see in Scripture that oftentimes it's the lowest of the low that embrace the gospel at, at the first. It's people who are not wealthy or wise, and you know, Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 6. So, so they're poor. We, we know in 2 Corinthians 8, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians who are wealthy, actually, comparatively, he uses the Macedonians and the Thessalonians. he uses them as a loving rebuke to the Corinthians. And this is what he says to the Corinthians about the Thessalonians. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. And here, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their port. So, so what's Paul saying here is that these people are dirt poor, grinding poverty. And, and yet what? They still give. Paul didn't demand it. Paul didn't ask for it. They simply gave. Now, ironically, one of the saddest statistics out there is that the more money an American has, the less they give as a percentage of their income. Okay, that's a, that's a sad irony. The poorer someone is in this country, the more they will give as a percentage of their income. You can look at studies that say that. Love to see that reversed, right? Love to see that reversed, that the wealthier you are, the more you give as a percentage of your income. But that's, that's another, another issue. But, but the issue here for Paul is that, look, I don't want to burden these people because it appears at least from what we can see, that they're very poor people. They're, they're not able to really support a pastor well. But not only that, not only that, what was the, what was the, the means of entertainment? And now, I don't, again, I like a good movie. I do, okay? Not opposed to, to going and seeing a good show. I appreciate good acting. I do. Uh, but, but there's going to be a strike, right? There's going to be an actor's strike, here over the next however long. And it's kind of raising a stink in Hollywood. <clears throat> it is. And, and again, I appreciate a good show. I really do. But, but <laughs> how are we going to be entertained? What's going to happen? Who's going to replace these awesome actors and actresses that are out there? It's kind of the stuff that's kind of going, going through our minds. And, and what will they demand? Well, well, friends, that was kind of the attitude that's going on in Thessalonica when people would come in. Their form of entertainment was speakers, wandering talkers. Remember how Paul says to the Athenians, or we, write, we learn about the Athenians, Acts 17, that all they did was sit around and hear different people speak. So that was their movies of that day was to go and listen to people on the street corners talk and, and they, would, they would judge them on how well they spoke. Did, were they fluent? Were they articulate? Did they use good grammar? Did they use highfalutin? It was all about presentation, all about oratorical skill and rhetoric, things like that. And then, of course, these people would stand on the street corners. And, again, if you walk down Pearl Street, I'm not opposed to people playing instruments and having a good time and you taking a couple bucks and throwing it in the hat. It's totally fine. But that's kind of what it was. That's kind of what it was. People would come up, they would speak, they would say things, they would show off their oratorical ability, and then the expectation was is that the people who sat there would throw in their coins. Paul wanted nothing to do with that. Not here to entertain. Not here to impress you with my oratory. I'm not here to shock you with my ability to speak or my reasoning power. Simply bringing the word of God to bear. And I'm not going to do it any way that causes people to question my motives or to think I'm in it for something other than God's glory and the benefit of you. And so the emphasis here is that 
Paul, when he's in these Roman cities, oftentimes he wouldn't even go out in public and speak. Remember, we, we hear him speaking in the synagogues. Or he'd go out to a place by the river where he knew there were some God-fearers down there. We don't, we don't hardly ever see him, come hear me. And in fact, the thought is this working day and night emphasis, yes, it was to support themselves, but also it was so they could be with people during the day to share the gospel with them while they worked. That was the means of gospel ministry in places like Thessalonica. It wasn't about gathering people together and hearing. It was about being involved in individual lives. Now, that doesn't mean Paul, he did speak in the synagogue. We know that from Acts 17 or 18, I'm sorry. No, 17. <clears throat> he did do that. But his emphasis here and the emphasis of his companion was to go and bring the word to bear one-on-one -on -one in small groups, things like that. And that's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. So, so he didn't want anything to hinder the spreading of God's word. And what would have hindered it is to demand, to demand as his is right, he, he said this, as an apostle of Christ, in verse 6, nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. It's within his right to say, I'm bringing the gospel to bear. I'm an apostle of Jesus. You need to support me. He could have done that. Would have been legit. But he chooses not to so that nothing will hinder the spreading of God's truth. Nothing at all. Think about Jesus. Yeah, we know the stories that he taught the thousands, right? The five thousands. But how many accounts in the Bible do we find of him ministering to one person? One person in a home. Uh, a Syrophoenician prostitute. One person. The Samaritan woman by the well. One person. And, and oftentimes that's where we see true, I mean, not, not to exclude Biblical ministry is occurring when he's preaching to the multitudes. But, but that's what we see. One, one leprosy-infested guy comes and says, Jesus, if you're willing, you can help me. What does Jesus do? He gets down on his knees. He touches him and says, I am willing. I'm willing. Jesus was not impressed with numbers. Paul's not impressed with numbers. He loves people, individuals. And he'll speak to them. In the public square, he'll speak to them in the workplace. The only thing he's concerned about is not causing stumbling. That's like a father. A true father in the faith will do all that is necessary to meet the needs of his family. And if that requires working two jobs to send his children to college, he'll do that. The emphasis being, he will lovingly care. He will sacrifice of himself, give of himself. The godly minister will be committed to unending selfless labor like that of a mother and father. 1 Corinthians 7, 19. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Our life is not our own. We are to serve Christ with everything. Now these, these last two aspects of godly leadership, this commitment to God, this lo loving discipline, again, I mean, think about Joshua as he is given reins of Israel going into the promised land and Moses speaks the words of God to him and he says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And why, why should Joshua be strong and courageous? Simply because Moses tells him to. No, Moses rehearses several things. He says to Joshua, God will be with you. God will keep his promises. God will empower you. And again, this falls back into those earlier statements in the first part of the chapter where the godly pastor's attitudes are articulated there. He's to be relying on God's word, trusting in God's word, relying on God's power, confident in, God appro in God's approval, seeking God's glory. That's what he's to be doing. And again, leadership of any kind requires strength and courage. It requires strength and courage because things are not easy. And any of you that are involved in even the smallest levels of ministry understand there's opposition at times. There's difficulties. There's hardships. People don't like it. Sometimes people say some pretty gnarly things. 
Joshua experienced that. Moses experienced that. Jesus experienced that. Paul experienced that. And so a pastor, as a father who is confronting and dealing and leading his children, at times needs to be firm, right? Strong and courageous. I've heard things like this, talking to a dad. What's your primary goal with your sons or your kids? Well, I just want to be their best friend. And I'm like, no! You know, amen. If you end up friends with your kids, that's great. And hopefully that's the, 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 the common end of things. But if that's your goal, problems. Your goal as a father, as with a pastor, is to push your kids to Jesus no matter what. No matter what. And that requires what? It requires a commitment to God. It requires a commitment to God. We looked at this at length last week. Reliance on God's power, trusting God's word, confidence in his approval. And again, Paul says, look at how holy we were. Look at how righteous and blameless we were. We are committed to God first. We're committed to God first. He lives before God first and foremost. He, he lives according to God's commands. He has a reputation of staying away from nonsense and sin. And again, the, the godly pastor, like a godly father, is committed first and foremost to following God with everything he has. And then trusting in God's promises and power that that will impact those who are behind him or below him or whom he's leading, not below in any derogatory sense. He is first and foremost committed to God. And then he's committed to loving discipline. Verse 12, we exhorted, encouraged, charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Again, exhortation, it's to come alongside, to aid, direct, instruct in wisdom. To encourage is to comfort and console because we all need that sometimes, right? We all need comfort and consolation when there's difficulties. I, I can name, I can't name. There's hundreds of times when Josh or Diz or Court or Joe or Rocky or Brian or somebody has come alongside, Josh Destry has come alongside and consoled me and comforted me. We all need that. Fathers need to do that with their kids. Pastors do that with their people. And again, there's, there's, a, there's a give and take there. But then there's also a charge. We charge you. In other words, we warn and admonish you. It's not simply enough. I, I want the church, the pastor can't stand up and say, I just want the church to like me. <laughs> I remember when I was a youth pastor, um, I was applying or I was a candidate for, for this youth pastor position. And, and the pastor called one of my references and the pastor asked the reference, will they rally around Eric? Will the kids rally around Eric? And Brian, it's not, not Murphy, it's a different Brian, but, but, but he goes, I don't know. <laughs> but he, they're going to be taught God's word. I guarantee that. And some of the kids did rally, some of them didn't. You know how it is. Uh, that, that's, that's the goal, right? I, the goal is not, to, is, is not to impress people or get them to rally around you, which, amen, if it happens, praise the Lord. But the goal is what? Teach, preach, admonish, charge, warn. I remember one time, I remember one time this youth this, I was teaching lessons, and there were several kids that were just knuckleheads like I was when I was that age. Right? And they're looking at me like this. And I'm teaching, and... And I, and I said, you know what? If you guys want to lie to me, you can get away with it. You can do it. If you want to try to fool me, you can. All right? I'm pretty stupid. Easy to, easy to fool, easy to deceive, just like everybody else. And this kid's looking at me. He just said that. So, but you can't fool God and you can't lie to him. He sees everything you're doing. Everything you're doing. That's a warning, right? That's a warning. That's what we do. God sees it all. Yes, it's to encourage. It's to admonish. It's to come alongside and walk in counsel. But it's to warn and charge. 
you need to be walking in a manner worthy of the gospel because if you're truly born again, you will walk in a manner worthy of the gospel because you have the nature of Christ. And if you're saying that you're born again and you're not walking in a manner worthy of the gospel, you need to go back and reevaluate your testimony and your faith because if anyone's in Christ, what, he's a new creature. The old thing's gone, new things have come. And you need to walk according to who God made you to be. And that's a lifetime work. It really, really is. When we were back in Delta serving in a church on the western part of the slope there, western slope of Colorado, country, farm town, cowboys, farmers. That's what it was. And one of our elders, Steve, was about as cowboy as you can get. All right. He really was. And big belt buckle, boots, whole nine yards. And the strongest, lankiest, strongest man I've ever, I mean, he was a great man of God, but maybe the strongest person I've ever seen. He, he, he shooed horses for a living. And if you know what that's like, that requires massive strength to do that. He was scared of nothing. And he came up to me one time, boys, you'll love this. He came up to me and so the boys are like seven, eight, six, five, somewhere in there. And he goes, Pastor, Serious look on his face. You and Paige are doing a great job raising them boys. Thanks, Steve. That's awfully kind. He says, you're doing just the right amount of whooping and the right amount of hugging. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. The boys won't forget that either. Um, <laughs> just the right amount of whooping and the right amount of hugging. And, and, and when I sit there and think about that, what a, what a great summary of what it means to truly love and care, right? You're hugging. You're admonishing. You're challenging, but you're also willing to be firm. And that's what it means to love. And that's what a pastor does. Amen? Amen. This is what we're to be like. And the interesting thing here, we won't do it, but, but I, ch- I challenge you, take some time over the next day or two and read through this passage again and look at how every single thing Paul says here stems from his vision of Jesus. Every single thing he says stems from the character and work and nature of Christ. Everything that Paul admonishes me and Josh and other leaders and admonishes you, this is what Jesus did. It's what he did and what he's doing now. This is your Savior, the chief shepherd. That's who he is. And that's who Paul would want me, Josh, other leaders of all churches everywhere to be. And he wants you to be that way too. He wants these characteristics to be manifested in your life as well. May the Lord bless the preaching of God's word. Let's pray and we'll stand and we'll sing. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example he left for us.